With the word of God in his hands, every human being, wherever his lot in life may be cast, may have such companionship as he shall choose. In its pages, he may hold converse with the noblest and best of the human race, and may listen to the voice of the Eternal as he speaks with men, as he studies and meditates upon the themes into which the angels desire to look, he may have their companionship. He may follow the steps of the heavenly teacher and listen to his words as when he taught on mountain and plain and sea. He may dwell in this world in the atmosphere of heaven, imparting to earth's sorrowing, tempted ones, thoughts of hope and longings for holiness, himself coming closer and still closer into fellowship with the unseen, like him of old who walked with God, drawing nearer and nearer the threshold of the eternal world until the portal shall open and he shall enter there. He will find himself no stranger. The voices that will greet him are the voices of the holy ones, voices who unseen were on earth his companions. Voices that here he learned to distinguish and to love. He who through the word of God has lived in fellowship with heaven will find himself at home in heaven's companionship. Amen. Education, page 127, paragraph 1. God is good. All and all the time. We thank God for preserving us up to this point during this day. The holy day is gone, am I right? Yes. But the sun never sets on your holiness. Are you with me? Yes. The sun does not set on our personal holiness. We are still holy people regardless of whatever plans you may have made for tonight. We are still holy people. The sun does not set on that. So please remember that. Let's take a look at the degree to which Christ took our sins. Let us go to 1 Peter chapter 2. We we'll read verse 24. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Do you have that? If you have my version, you may read with me. Who his own self bear our sins where? In his own body on the tree. The tree being a reference to the cross. Let's look at that verse again microscopically. Who his own self bear our sins where? In his own body. He took our sins into him. As the good doctor said, this is no vicarious act. He took our sins into him. Let's go to one of the most important verses in all the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Our subject, direction is everything. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We read that again. By the way, when you study the Bible, whatever verse you're studying or passage, read it many times. Not just once. Read it as if nothing else in the world exists but you and that text and the Holy Ghost. Concentrate on what you're reading. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who is he? It's not Jesus. Who is he in that verse? God the Father. He hath made him. Who is him? Jesus Christ. To be sin for us. Now right after us says, who knew no sin? Who knew no sin? Jesus, not us. That we might be made. Who does the making? Are you sure it's God? 
This is the second time we see make in that word, whether make or made. The first time it's used, who's doing the making? Who's doing the making the second time? God, still God. Still God. For he, God, hath made him to be sin. That's a strong statement. It's also a statement that gives me great comfort regarding the purity of Christ. For he hath made him to be sin. Now, we heard earlier this morning we don't believe in original sin because sin is a choice. Are you with me? Sin is a choice. Listen to the verse and keep the concept of choice in your mind. For he, the Father, hath made him to be sin. He is sin. On the cross, that is sin. God only curses sin. Are you with me? God only turns away from sin. The only reason why people die is because of sin. By the way, people don't die of hypertension and diabetes. We die of sin. Whether it's sin we committed or just living in a sinful world or coming into life with a fallen name, we die because of sin. He hath made him to be sin for us. Question for you. Why did God have to make him to be sin for us? Now we have God and we have him. Who is him? Jesus. God made him to be sin for us. Why did God do that? Okay, let me ask you this. If you were, let's say Dr. Norman was walking down the steps and I held his hand to walk him down, what might he say to me? What might he say? He's a grown man, physically fit, and I'm taking his hand, helping him down the stairs. What might he say to me nicely? I can do that myself. Are you with me? I can do that myself. Now, for he, God, hath made him to be sin. Question for you. Could Jesus have made himself sin? Why not? Why not? Ah, if he had chosen. Someone else had to make him sin because he did not make himself sin. In other words, he never chose to sin. He had to be made sin. Follow me closely. That's one half of the algebraic formula there. Let's look at the other half. That we might be made we have to be made righteous. First, finish my words. Come on, finish my words. No, 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 no. Listen, listen microscopically. The Father made him to be sin. He had to be made sin because in him was no sin. All right. Concentrate. Now we are made righteous, finish my words, because there's no righteousness in us. Thank you for that isolated amen. <laughs> he had to be made sin. Because he never chose to sin. We have to be made righteous. Because there is not one iota of righteousness in us naturally. What does the Bible say? Jesus himself said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. What else did he say? It is the spirit that quickeneth, John 6, 63, the flesh profiteth nothing. What did Paul say? I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. All right. I got a question for you. Before I, well, no, let me ask you the question now. You don't have to answer. How could Jesus take all the sins into him how could he be made sin? How could he be someone who had all our infirmities, familiar with them, and yet remain pure? How can we have a sinful nature and still live a pure life? Let's pray again. 
Holy Father in heaven, as I, ha as I handle truth, and the carnal nature cannot originate truth, speak through me, dear God. Give me simplicity of language. Let me seek your glory, not mine. In Jesus' name I plead. Amen. Go with me to Mark 7. We read microscopically, closely. It's 21 minutes to 8. You've had a long day. Can you give me to 8.15, yes or no? Yes. All right. Thank you for being gracious. God bless you. What book did I say? What book did I say? Mark 7 is not a book. <laughs> what book did I say? Ah, uh, concentrate. Now, what chapter? Ah, you're nice people. You're good looking. God bless you. Mark 7, reading from verse 14. When you found it, say amen. amen. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you. Finish the verse. And understand. Now, is Jesus telling us the same thing? Yes. Why do you hesitate? Yes. He tells us, hearken unto me. That's what you do when you read the Bible. And understand. Next verse. There is nothing. Did you, do you read that in your version? There is nothing. Come on, read with me. From without a man that entering into him can defile him. But what? The things which come out of him, those are there that defile the man. We'll read that verse again. There is nothing. Stop. What does nothing exclude? Nothing. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parables. And he said unto them, he saith unto them, are ye so without understanding also? Read with me now. Do ye not perceive that what? Whatsoever from without entereth into the man, come on, it cannot defile him. Here's his explanation now, keep reading. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, pushing all meat. Jesus says, look, in order for something from outside to defile you, it has to enter into the heart. There is nothing. Now, verse 20, read with me. And he said, what? That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Stop. We read it again. How is a man defiled? What comes out of him? That which cometh out of the man, that defileth. Now, we know he's talking about moral defilement, sin. How do we know that? Let's keep reading. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now Matthew gives the same story and Matthew ends by saying, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. If you eat a pork chop, you're not morally defiled by the pork chop. The decision to eat it came from your heart. That's the defilement. God made pigs, I imagine. And God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. Whatever purpose they were made to fulfill, that's good. And you drink coffee. You know, by the way, there's some Adventists who say, what's wrong with a cup of coffee? Eve could have said, what's wrong with a little fruit? That's what vegetarians do. 
But look at us today. For from within, your husband can't make you the witch of Endor. You have to choose to be that. Your wife can't make you first cousin to Barabbas. You have to choose that. Yes, they can create stressful environments for you. Your boss can't make you a, a demon. Because the fire doesn't go from the outside in. Finish my words. It goes from the inside out. All right. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Anyone confused? All right. Let's go to Leviticus 1. Leviticus 1. What is Jesus doing now? What's going, what began in 1844, October 22? The cleansing of the what? And I said this morning, this has to be cleansed first. Are you with me? All right. We go to Leviticus 1, we'll read from verse 1. Third book of the Bible, if you can condense Leviticus to one word, it would be holiness. Do you have that? Let me pray. Father, be with me. I enter into this phase of the message. Be with me, dear God, please, in Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering to the Lord, he shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. Cattle being bulls, the herd being um, domestic animals, flock being sheep. All right. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him what? Offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it, come on, of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Let's read verse 3 again. Read that for me. What does that say? If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, come on. Let him offer a male without blemish. What's the spiritual equivalent of without blemish? Without sin. Because the animal represents it, represents Jesus. All right. Verse 4. Read with me. And he shall do what? Put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Now, what is the significance of placing his hands on the head of the burnt offering? Let the Bible explain. Leviticus 16, verse 20. Our subject, direction is everything. It's a quarter to eight. I asked for 8.15. I may let you out before. Because it's been a long day for you and for me. For all of us. But we thank God for the freedom to assemble and worship. Can you say amen? amen. We thank God we're still alive. I've never seen a dead, tired man. Can you, can you follow what I'm trying to say? I've never seen a dead person who was tired. It's a privilege to be tired. It means you're alive. You don't believe what I'm saying? Okay. It's a privilege to feel cold. You're alive. Leviticus 16, reading verse 20. Are you there? Read with me. What does that say? Come on, read nice and loud. And when he hath made an end of reconciling what? The holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall do what? Bring the live goat. By the way, let me pause. Some people say, some churches, maybe even have that the Azazel represents Jesus. No. Notice the verse says, when he hath made the end of reconciling the holy place, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar, when all reconciliation by Christ is done, that's when we get to the goat that represents Azazel. Mm -hmm. Verse 21, nice and clear and loud. Come on. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the, of the live goat and shall confess over him, come on, all the iniquities of the children of Israel, come on, and all the transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. Stop now. So this symbolizes a transfer of sin. 
We go back to chapter 1, verse 4. Are you there? Yes. Read with me. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Let's read 5 and go on down. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and Aaron the priest shall do what? Bring his blood and sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 6, and he shall flay the burnt offering. Come on, and... Cut it into its pieces. What does the word flay mean? To skin. Mm -hmm. And he shall flay. That's the sinner. The burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. Verse 7. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall do what? Put fire upon the altar and lay the wood how? In order. upon the. By the way, the wood couldn't be placed anyway. It had to be placed in order. When you worship God, that worship must be orderly. Amen. The way you sing must be orderly. Everything must be orderly. This goes all the way back to Abraham and before. When God called Abraham and told him, sacrifice Isaac. I believe verse 9 of Genesis, the Bible says, And Abraham came to the place which God had told him of. And he built an altar there and laid the wood in order on the altar. Disorderly worship is offensive to God. Disciplined worship. Every person in his or her place at the right time. You know why armies look so beautiful when they march, when they parade? Everyone is in step. But I'll leave that alone. Verse 7, And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Now, read verse 8 for me. And the priest, Aaron shall, come on, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, come on, upon the altar, come on, which is upon the, all right. So the parts are laid. But read verse 9. What does that say? But he shall, but the inwards and the legs, come on, shall he wash? Stop. The animal had to be, according to verse 3, without blemish. How was the man to know it had no blemish? He looked at it. He has sinned. His household has sinned. He picks a lamb. He's going to the, the tabernacle. It has no, no broken legs. No, another lamb didn't tear off the ear. He looks. No blemishes where? On the outside. But God is more concerned with. Mm -hmm. But he wants blemishes nowhere. So the animal comes, no blemishes on the outside. But the inside has to be checked. So verse, says, verse 6 says, And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. Verse 9 says, But the inwards and the legs shall he wash. He makes sure there's nothing inside that's unclean. As children of God, we have to be clean, finish my words, inside and outside. Or the work of sanctification is not complete. All right. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash with water. And the priest shall burn on all, the, all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of sweet savor, Unto the Lord. With one blemish, it would not be a sweet savor because sin does not smell nice. What's our subject? What question are we trying to answer? How could Christ take all our sins and remain pure? Let's go back to verse 4 of Leviticus 1. Read with me. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Okay. 
What does that symbolize, placing the hand on the head of the animal? Transfer of what? Sin. Mm -hmm. Before I ask you the next question, let's go back to Mark. I hope you don't mind running from book to book. Let's go back to Mark, chapter 7. We read from 20. Mark 7, verse 20. And I continue to ask God to speak through me as I speak to his people. I hope someone has already prayed for me in the congregation and said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. It's a desperate need that I have. Jesus said, what? And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed. What does proceed mean? Yeah, travel, yeah, yeah, go, travel out, yeah, proceed from the heart. You see, from within, it proceeds, it goes out. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Now, we have to believe that list is not exhausted. Because the, the Bible says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Meaning, the list can go on and on. But however long the list is, it comes from here and causes defilement. Hmm? It's choice, yes. Now go back to Leviticus 1. 5 to 8. Read verse 4 with me now. You read it, I'll listen to you. King James people, read it. And he shall... Stop. What does that symbolize? All right, quiz question number one. In what direction is the sin traveling when the sinner puts his head on the animal? Pause, pause, pause. Let me ask you a different question. After the sinner has confessed his sins on that animal, is the animal still pure? Does the animal represent Jesus? Is Jesus pure? After the sinner has confessed over that animal, is the animal still pure? Would you like to change your mind? All those who say it's still pure, let me see your hands. Those who say it is now defiled with those sins, let me see your hands. All right. Listen. <laughs> this is serious. Listen to me carefully. No, listen to the Bible. And he shall place his hands upon the head of the burnt offering or the sacrifice, transferring sins. Where is the sinner in relation to the, the, the animal? He's outside the animal. Are you listening to me? You're not listening to me. Are you listening to me? He is outside the animal. Huh? Where are the sins going symbolically? In what direction? From, come on, in what direction? From the outside, in. But what did Jesus say? There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. So when he confessed all his sins upon that animal, symbolically, the animal remained pure because the things did not come from the animal's heart. It came from the outside in. What's our subject? Now let's go back to Jesus. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body. Huh? In the body. Where did the sins have to come from? Outside. And traveling in what direction? In. But what did Jesus say? Nothing going from outside in, come on, can defile.
And so Christ can take the sins of the world. Finish my words. And remain, come on, pure. Only divinity can arrange that plan. Now, that purity of the Christ, that Christ lived on this earth, is the purity required of us. Notice my words carefully. The purity of the life of Christ on earth is the purity required of us. This, let's, this, let the Bible describe this heart. Jeremiah 79, don't go there. Just say it. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's this. We're born with that. Jeremiah 13, 23, don't go there. Just say it. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopards his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. The, word, the answer is no, you cannot. It's impossible. Let's go to Romans 8, 7, and 8. Don't go, don't go there. Say it. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It is impossible for the carnal heart to obey God. Deceitful above all things. Cannot change its spots. Even if you painted stripes on a leopard, it's still spotted. You know why? It is spotted in the genes. So you put high priestly robes on a sinner, he's still a sinner. You put a pig in a palace, still a pig. Because it is genetically determined now. Because this is the heart that we have. Christ has to change it. So out of it comes not sin, but that which pleases God. Are you following me? Because defilement goes from thee. Mm -hmm. So does righteousness. <laughs> Ellen White writes, The law that seeketh not its own has its source in the heart of God. That's where it came from. A good man... Out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. As verily as sin and defilement flow from the fallen heart out, righteousness flows from the renewed heart out. Amen. Listen to what God does. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. What's our subject? Quickly. The direction is everything. Jeremiah 31. Let's go there. We'll read verse 33. It's 8 o'clock on the dot. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. What's the nickname for Isaiah? The gospel prophet, yes. He wrote so much about Jesus. All of Isaiah 58 is about Jesus. 53, sorry. Elway says, read it every day. It'll humble you. Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. What chapter did I say? Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, reading verse 33. Let me pray, Father. Continue to be with me as I have 15 minutes left. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Where are my King James people? Read nice and loud and clear. What does it say? But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after this, day, saith the Lord. Read slowly now. I will do what? Where? Come on, and? Stop. I will put my law. Where? Mm -hmm. And write it where? Virtually the same thing. Mm -hmm. Put or write, inward parts of the heart, same thing. Now, what else does God write on the heart? Well, we just read that. So my question is, what else does he write? Now the verse says, I'll put my laws in the inward parts. What else does he write in the inward parts? Nothing. All he puts, finish my words, is the law. Are you following me? That's all he puts. Now listen to what the effect the law 
truly written in the heart, the effect it has on the person. Go to Levit not Leviticus, Malachi 2. Malachi 2. The last book of the Old Testament, book 39. It's a beautiful book. Read Malachi. It's this back and forth between God and the Israelites. God says one thing. They say, when did we do that? God says something else. When did we do that? God says something else. When did we do that? And that hasn't changed in, in, among us one bit. Malachi 2 verse 6. God is talking about the Levites called to be priests, teachers of the law. Do you have Malachi 2 verse 6? Read microscopically. What does it say? The law of truth was in his mouth. Stop. That's Levi as a tribe. Read the next statement. And iniquity was not found in his lips. Now, practically speaking, is lips different from mouth in that verse? No. You need to understand something called Hebrew parallelism. You say the same thing differently. Let me give an example. Jacob also went down into Egypt. Now, Israel also entered into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the, sojourned in the land of Ham. Who is Jacob? Israel. What is Egypt? The land of Ham. It's the same thing expressed differently. Here's another example. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Same thing. Another example, for he spake, it was done. He commanded, it stood fast. Speak and commanded are not two different things God did. Are you with me? No, you're not with me. Are, are you with me? Yeah. Now let's go back to, to Malachi 2.6. Concentrate. The law of truth was where? In his mouth. Then what could not be in his lips? Iniquity. Why? Because the law was there. His mouth was full of the law. So there was no room for iniquity. The problem with us, the law is not really written on our hearts. It's in the Bible, on our shelves. Because where the law truly exists, sin cannot exist as a lifestyle. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. If sin is regularly found in my heart, the law is not really written there. Why could Jesus live a victorious life? I delight to do thy will, O my God. Finish the words. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And the will of God is the law of God. Let me say it again. The will of God, condensed, summarized, is the law of God. Go to Romans 2. Let's read from verse 17. Direction is everything. It's 7 after 8. I have 8 minutes. Romans 2, reading from verse 17. Are you there? My people, read with me. Behold, thou art called a Jew. Come on, and... Rest us in the law and makest thy boast of God and knowest his will. Come on, and approvest the things that are more excellent. Finish the verse. Being instructed out of the law. The law is God's will. Approvest the things that are more excellent means knowing how to determine what's good from what's bad, what's genuine, false, what's right, what's wrong. Being instructed out of the law. Now, when Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, cut the whole list. That's the unconverted heart. Are you with me? 
Let's look at it. Go to Galatians 5. We look at the switch, the, 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 the transfer from unconverted to converted and see the difference in what emerges from the heart. Galatians 5, we read 19 to 23. That was our scripture reading. Galatians 5. Do you have that? Galatians 5, Galatians 5. Read with me. But the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like everything of the which I have told you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they, come on, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Keep going. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Come on. Against such, there is no law. Now, when it says there is no law against it, it doesn't mean there is no law in existence. There is no law against it because the law is for it. Now, look again. Adultery, fornication, verse 19 to 21, those are the works of the flesh. The flesh isn't this. The flesh is this nature. Are you with me? That's what it produces. When we're converted and we walk by the Spirit, something else comes from the inside. What's that? Love, joy, from the inside out. You combine that to one word, righteousness. Both. Come from the inside. And so Jesus could take all our sins and remain sinless because no sin travels from the inside out with Christ. They travel from the outside in. And he said there's nothing from without a man entering into him can defile him. We have a Savior who mysteriously took our sins into him and remained sinless because he never chose to sin. Through the process of justification, maintained through sanctification or forgiveness, as my brother said earlier, we can choose the heart of Christ. And despite the fact we still possess, we still possess, not possessed by, we still possess a carnal nature, out of our new hearts will come Love, joy, peace. Because God will have written his law on our hearts. Amen. Go to 2 Corinthians 3. It's 10 after 8. 2 Corinthians 3, let's read verse 3. Do you have that? All right. One more prayer. Father in heaven, the end is near. Don't end your help. Continue to be with me, Lord, because in the final minutes, the devil may twist my tongue. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you have 2 Corinthians 3.3? 3? Read it with me. What does it say, my King James people? For as much as you manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ. Stop. We should all be epistles of Christ read by the world. Are you with me? Letters of love, letters of righteousness, letters of the character of Christ written by, uh, read by the world. Come on. Ministered by us. Now read carefully, microscopically, and keep your mind on the writing of the law on the tables of stone at Sinai. Are you with me? Keep reading. Written, not with ink, come on, but with the spirit of the living God. Keep going. Not tables of stone, come on, but on fleshy tables of the heart. What Paul is saying, the law by the spirit is written not on stone, but here. By the way, it was the Holy Ghost that, read, that wrote the law on stone. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to show you that. It's easily shown. It was the Holy. You see, the Father required the law to be spoken. Christ was his agent. In creation and salvation, Christ is the agent of the Father. Christ literally spoke the commandments. The Holy Spirit wrote them. So the whole family of heaven was involved in giving the commandments. Are you with me? The, the Holy Spirit that wrote the commandments on stone is the one who writes the commandments on our hearts. 
And what else was written on those stones? Nothing. Because all God wants is obedience. Listen to the Bible. These words are from the wisest man who ever lived. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Finish it. For this is the whole duty of man. In other words, God says, I require nothing from you that falls outside the Ten Commandments. Condensed to two principles, love for God, love for man. And because we have a fallen mind by birth, we can't grasp a divine law. So we can justifiably ask God, how do I love my neighbor? How do I do this? Respect your parents. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. These are expressions of love to your neighbor. Because our carnal minds couldn't understand. How do I love God? God says, here's how you love me. Have no one else before me. Don't take my name in vain. Don't worship idols. Don't make them. Don't worship them. Don't take my name in vain and keep the Sabbath. That's how you love me. He writes that right here. So the heart on which the law is written loves God and loves people. And those whom we love, we don't hurt. What does the Bible say? Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. No ill. That's why love is the fulfilling of the law. What's our subject? In what direction does defilement flow? From the inside out. Repent of that sin. From the inside out. Let me ask again. In what direction does defilement flow? From the inside out. Where does adultery come from? Where does uh, theft come from? Backbiting, Inside. lusting, Inside. pride. Inside. Where does righteousness come from? Inside. From the heart given by God, Amen. not the one you're born with. Now, let's ask God, Father, rewrite your law on my heart. Amen. Sometimes when a document is old, the ink fades. Hmm? Well, no one knows what ink is because we type everything on iPads. But in my day, you use pens and the, the ink would fade. We want God to rewrite the law tonight by his spirit. We don't want him to write it. We want him to etch it. You know what etching is? It's etch. It's dug into the material. Writing is just, you can't erase etching just like that with a rubber, with an eraser. You can. You want it etched. How many of you will say with me, Father, etch your law on my heart tonight and right now. Can I see your hand? Do you mean that, yes or no? Stand up with me. Etch it. And that goes for all ages. God wants to write his law on your heart. How old are you? Ten. Jesus was ten. How old are you? Jesus was twelve. And the doctors couldn't answer him. Mm -hmm. He could recite Genesis to Revelation, all 66, when he was 12. We're standing to say, Father, etch your law on my heart. Believe he'll do it. You know why? 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he doeth it. If there's one thing that's God's will, it is writing the law on our hearts. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear Father in heaven, if I misrepresented you, I apologize to you. My desire was to present the truth as simply as possible. But Father, no human effort can be fully satisfactory. And so I ask you that God, through the Spirit, take this meager effort of mine somehow make it meaningful to your people as you re-emphasize it in their minds as they travel. God, Father of Jesus and our Father, etch your law in our hearts anew right now. Not as don't do this and don't do that, but as love for you and love for our fellow man. Father, no one has to tell a loving mother there's a law that says thou shalt feed thy baby. 
She feeds that baby even if she dies. That's the way love works. When love is in the heart, dear God, it directs us, it teaches us. Please, God, let from our hearts, converted, flow the principles of righteousness. Bless your people bowing in your presence, Father. Remind them how much you love them. The most popular verse in your book says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The verse does not say, For God so loved his Son that he gave up the world. But for God so loved the world that he gave up his Son. That is love we cannot understand. But Father, when we realize to some degree how much you love us, we consider the accuracy of 1 John 4.19. We love him because he first loved us. Let us leave this place believing that your law has been re-etched in our hearts, dear God. So if anything befalls us on the way, we behave like a righteous person. Watch over us as we sleep, God, because the devil never sleeps. He tries to take our lives during the night. Let a mighty angel stand by every bedside. Bring us back tomorrow, Father. A little spiritually stronger than we are now. Bring us back tomorrow strong, I pray, to close off this blessed weekend. And if we dream, let us dream of Jesus. In his name we pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our closing hymn is... What she sings. What she sings. Before we sing our closing prayer, uh, just remember our booths are downstairs. And uh, feel free to visit the different ministries. And also, please uh, come back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. All right. Five ninety-eight. Five ninety-eight.
Amen. You may be seated and have a good evening. Let's stand. <laughs> Is there something else going on? That's it. Okay. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Let God's people say amen and amen. God bless you. Sleep well. Dream of Jesus. Keep the speed limit and we'll see you tomorrow. When I say keep the speed limit, I'm serious. You can't say grant me traveling mercies and then speed. You can't do that. So keep the speed limit. we see you tomorrow. <laughs>